Okay. So, um, location of the heart, just you know, not completely on the left side, not completely on the right side. Um, to the left of mediastinal line between the second and the fifth rib. Okay. Base of the heart is actually top. Apex of the heart is at the bottom, you know, of the ventricles. Three pericardial layers. F Cardium. Sorry, this should have been done here. So three pericardial layers, um, fibrous pericardium, visceral pericardium, parietal pericardium. Um, pericardial cavity is covered by parietal, heart is covered by visceral, and yes, they are serous membranes. Between the visceral and parietal pericardium is pericardial cavity filled with fluid. Pericardial inflammation is pericarditis. In case of pericarditis, fluid volume in the pericardial cavity increases, which leads to pericardial tamponade and pericardial tamponade impairs the contractile ability of the heart because it increases the pressure in the heart from outside. Roughening of the visceral and parietal pericardium in pericarditis leads to the pericardial friction rub that can be heard in auscultation. Epicardium is basically pericardium, right? The visceral one. Myocardium, it's the cardiac muscle, mainly and the connective tissue skeleton that basically holds the heart together. Inflammation of myocardium is myocarditis. Endocardium is layer of endothelial, layer of endothelial cells that cover the heart from the inside. It's simple squamous epithelium. Inflammation of endocardium is called endocarditis. It often affects cardiac valves, making them incompetent. So they do not completely close, leading to regurgitation of the blood. Atria are the receiving chambers of the heart. They receive blood. The right atrium receives the blood from the systemic circuit by vena cava, sends the blood into the pulmonary circuit by pulmonary arteries. Left atrium receives the blood from pulmonary veins and pumps the blood from the pulmonary circuit, you know, and receives the blood. Sorry, misspoke. You didn't catch me, but I missed one. Right atrium receives the blood. I was thought about the entire right. Right atrium receives the blood from systemic circuit by vena cava and sends it to the right ventricle. Thank you. Left atrium receives the blood from pulmonary circuit by pulmonary veins and sends it into the left ventricle. Atria is separated by um, interatrial septum. Oracles are structures that expand the volume of atria. Fossa ovalis is the remnant of uh, uh, foramen ovalis, ovali that uh, used to be in the fetal heart. Ventricles pump the blood, the pumping parts of the heart. Right ventricle receives the blood from right atrium and sends it into the pulmonary trunk and pulmonary arteries into the system, uh, pulmonary circuit. Left ventricle receives the blood from the left atrium and sends it into the systemic circuit via aorta. Ventricles are separated by interventricular septum. Uh, in the coronary and interventricular, in interventricular sulci are coronary arteries. 
okay? Boundaries of the coronary sorry. Chordae tendinae are connective tissue structures that attach valves to the papillary muscles. Papillary muscles regulate opening and closing of the valves. Vessels that deliver the blood to the right atrium are superior and inferior vena cava, left atrium, pulmonary veins. Vessels that take the blood away from right ventricle is pulmonary trunk, from left ventricle, aorta. Right atrium and ventricle are separated by the tricuspid valve, left atrium and ventricle by mitral valve. Right ventricle and pulmonary trunk are separated by the pulmonary valve, left ventricle and aorta are separated by the aortic semilunar valve. Arteries carry the blood from the heart, veins always carry the blood to the heart. Veins do not always carry deoxygenated blood. For instance, pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood. And pulmonary arteries carry deoxygenated. Those are exceptions. Valvular stenosis is a narrowing down of the cardiac valves. Incompetent valve is the one that cannot close completely, leading to regurgitation. Regurgitation by incompetent valve leads to the um, improper blood flow and heart has to pump harder, which may lead to dilated or non-dilated cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> Treatment options is the valve replacement. We basically describe the blood flow through the heart. So look, vena cava, so you need to be able to trace it down from vena cava to aorta through all the chambers, circuits, and valves. Does that make sense? Can you do that? I think you can. So that's first brain dump that I suggest you to take. Are blood volumes different between pulmonary and systemic circuit? No. Pulmonary circuit Oxygenation of the blood, systemic circuit, delivery of oxygen to the tissues. Pulmonary circuit is shorter with a lower blood pressure, so the wall of the right ventricle is thinner than the wall of the left ventricle. Pulmonary circuit is shorter. So the blood pressure in the pulmonary circuit is lower and the ventricular wall of the right ventricle is thinner. If there is a, sorry about the sound, if there is a mismatch between the volumes and the two circuits, we call it congestive heart failure. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. Coronary circuit is the circuit of blood vessels that supply the cardiac muscle, angina pectoris is reduced um, flow through one of the vessels in the coronary circuit that leads to the chest pain. Coronary arteries arise from aorta. Left coronary artery supplies mainly left side of the heart. Right coronary artery supplies the right side. Anastomoses are connections between the blood vessels. They can be arterial, venular, or arteriovenular anastomosis. The importance is to provide an additional path for blood flow. Okay, especially in the coronary circuit, anastomosis allow the blood to bypass blood vessels that are kind of, you know, obstructed, smaller ones. Myocardial infarction is complete obstruction of blood flow to a certain part of the heart. It leads to ischemia and death. It can be caused by um, blood clot, dislodged plaque that obstructed the blood vessel, or extreme constriction of the blood vessel. Cardiac muscle contracts involuntarily. Cells are 
striated because there are sarcomeres. Cells are branched and usually have one or two nuclei. Cells are connected by intercalated discs that contain gap junctions, provide communication between cardiomyocytes, and desmosomes that hold cardiomyocytes together. Calcium binds to troponin. Troponin, well, <laughs> binds calcium and shifts tropomyosin away from the binding sites on the actin. Well, tropomyosin blocks the binding sites. So when it is shifted, actin, which forms thin filaments, can bind to myosin, which is thick filaments. And when actin and myosin form what we call a cross bridge contraction, sliding filament contraction starts. So contractile mechanism, again calcium binds to troponin, troponin shifts tropomyosin away from the actin, actin can now form cross bridge with myosin and that initiates the contraction. Sarcoplasmic reticulum provides source intracellular source of calcium and T-tubules enable the proper excitation contraction coupling so that action potential on the surface and the membrane of the muscle cells can reach sarcoplasmic reticulum. Cross bridge is the structure that is formed between actin and myosin. It is a myosin head that binds to the actin and propels the actin during the contraction. ATP is required for cross bridge cycle. Now, depolarization of cardiomyocytes is due to the influx of sodium through voltage-gated sodium channel. These voltage-gated sodium channels at maximum depolarization close. And next, potassium and calcium channels open. Calcium channels are slow, but they allow calcium to flow into the cardiomyocyte, forming a plateau. Okay, that plateau ensures an extended cardiomyocyte contraction. Potassium channels, voltage-gated potassium channels, lead to the repolarization of uh, cardiomyocytes. Absolute refractory period is the time when there can be absolutely no new depolarization of cardiomyocyte. It's important to make sure that cardiomyocytes do not go into the titanic contraction. Absolute refractory period occurs because sodium channels at the maximum depolarization not just close, they get inactivated. So they cannot be opened for a certain amount of time. Cardiomyocytes can use practically any fuel from lactic acid to fatty acids to glucose. But the aerobic metabolism is preferred cardiomyocytes. In ischemia, when there is no oxygen supply to cardiomyocytes, they switch to fermentation forming lactic acid. Lactic acid leads to the release of calcium from sarcoplasmic reticulum, which damages mitochondria. Damaged mitochondria lead to reduced ATP production and reduced availability of ATP closes gap junctions. Result of that closure is insufficient communication between cardiomyocytes leading to fibrillation. Pacemaker cells set the cardiac rhythm and gap junctions enable the communication between cardiomyocytes that set the rhythm for the entire, cell, uh, the entire heart. So the pacemaker potential 
here is formed by influx of sodium through leaky sodium channels. When pacemaker cell reaches the threshold, it gets depolarized by the influx of calcium into the cell. The top of depolarization, calcium channels close. <coughs> Sorry. Potassium channels open. And potassium flows out of the pacemaker cell, essentially repolarizing it. And pay, uh, the whole pacemaker potential thing starts again. So when cell reaches action potential, calcium channels close. Okay. When cell, pacemaker cell is completely repolarized here, potassium channels close. Now, structures that represent conduction system. Say note, AV note, um, AV bundle, bundle branches, Purkinje fibers. Know the sequence? Absolutely. And no intrinsic heart rate. Okay. So, that's the order. Electrical connection between atria and ventricles is the um, AV node to bundle, to AV bundle. There are no gap junctions. Remember, no gap junctions that connect atria and ventricles. So atria and ventricles will contract at the different time. Remember that. I mentioned it. It's really important. Okay. The only connection is connection of AV node to the AV bundle. Did I make myself clear? So, impulse at AV node is delayed, meaning that ventricles will contract after atria. In EKG or ECG, the electrical flow through the cardiac muscle is measured. P wave, depolarization of atria and contraction of atria. QRS complex, atrial repolarization, ventricular depolarization, T wave, ventricular repolarization. I will ask you this question. Basically, what happens in P wave? Or which EKG event corresponds to ventricular repolarization? Am I clear? B wave is atrial depolarization, QRS is atrial repolarization and ventricular depolarization, T wave is ventricular repolarization. Okay, so PR interval is the time when that takes from depolarization of atria to depolarization of ventricles. ST segment is the time when ventricles are completely depolarized. Okay. Uh, QT interval is the time from atrial repolarization to ventricular repolarization. Okay. So I obviously when I was breaking them up, I didn't remember this. So you don't have to answer that same question twice. It's the time when um, ventricular wall is completely depolarized. Um, which part of the brain stem regulates the heart rate? Um, medulla. Which branch of INS sets the normal heart rate? Parasympathetic. It inhibits the cardiac conduction system. Um, may I skip the tachycardia and bradycardia? Got it. Tachycardia is fast, bradycardia is slow. They can be normal. A say block. Say no doesn't work. What you're not going to see? Huh? No P wave. SA. SA. QRS is AV. So, and it's, so, here's the deal. SA is initiator. No initiation, atria do not contract. If you have a complete SA block, like SA node is gone. Which node is taking over? AV. 
How do we call this rhythm? Junctional. Thank you very much. Junctional rhythm. Is that healthy? No. No, it's not. I mean, no, it's not. just no, it's not. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Atria do not depolarize. AV note takes over. AV block. Okay. That's bad. Now, question. Well, from time to time, AV, like, you can see the delayed heartbeat in the ventricle. It's not very frequent, but you can see it in otherwise healthy person. But generally, AV block is bad. In the first degree AV block, what you're going to see? Delayed QRS, delayed ventricular contraction. Does that make sense? In the second degree AV block, what you're going to see? That's kind of more significant. Dropped B. P wave, no QRS, no T, another P wave. Does that make sense? Third degree AV block. What does that mean? AV is toast. Okay? If AV, if AV node is toast, what takes over? Hold on. We didn't cure the patient yet. Not a pacemaker. What takes over first when AV node is, huh? Bundle bundle, uh, AV bundle, or bundle branches, or maybe Purkinje fibers. Depends on the extent of the damage. Does that make sense? Basically, the following systems. Your SA node can be totally functional, but if there is no transmission through AV node, it doesn't matter. Okay? Now, a rhythm that is set by, say, AV bundle, is that compatible? Is that survivable? No, so what needs to be installed? Pacemaker. You got it. Ectopic focus is contraction, uh, sorry, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Depolarization outside of SA node, usually located in the atrial wall, in most cases, causes premature atrial contraction, can happen in a healthy patient. Causes of premature ventricular contraction. Usually the same, but the more significant predictor for clinical pathology. Now, what's the fibrillation in general? Unsynchronized contractions of the cardiac muscle. Atrial fibrillation is less dangerous. Ventricular is more. Atrial fibrillation will be reflected by absence of P waves, basically. Okay, complete absence of P waves, weirdly shaped QRS, just one peak, okay. Atrial fibrillation, main clinical complication that we have to be concerned about is thrombosis, formation of thrombi that can enter, say, coronary circulation or pulmonary circulation or cerebral circulation. Coronary circulation thrombus means myocardial infarction, pulmonary circulation thrombus, pulmonary embolism, Cerebral circulation thrombus means ischemic stroke. What happens to the patient with a ventricular fibrillation? Untreated patient. Patient dies. The only reasonable treatment option, defibrillator, which resets the heart. Does that make sense? It basically wipes out all the electrical impulses, hoping that the heart will be able to restart itself. That make sense? During diastole, atria is relaxed, uh, ventricles are relaxed, blood flows into the ventricles. Um, in diastole, not yet, not yet contracted, okay? Not yet, everything is relaxed. No depolarization, nothing contracts. Pressure in the ventricles is the lowest. Um, AV valves are open, semilunar are closed, and then atrial contraction corresponds to T wave. And at the end of diastole, after atria completely contract, it's end diastolic volume. 
an isovolumetric contraction phase, <coughs> ventricles start to contract. So ventricular muscles are depolarized and contract. Pressure in the atria is lower than in the ventricles, and in the ventricles lower than the great vessels. All valves are closed. Ventricular pressure during that phase increases. Ventricular volume goes down, but the volume of the blood in the ventricles doesn't change. Blood doesn't go anywhere. <coughs> and then semilunar valves open and ventricular ejection phase, systole, pushes the blood into the great vessels. Ventricular muscles keep contracting. Ventricular pressure is the highest. AV valves Sorry, semilunar valves are open and AV valves are closed. Blood goes into the great vessels. At the end of systole, the volume of blood is end systolic volume. Then heart starts to relax. All valves are closed. Ventricular muscles are relaxing, being repolarized. Ventricular pressure is in between atrial and pressure in great vessels. All valves are closed. Blood doesn't go anywhere. Okay. Ventricular pressure decreases. Ventricular volume slight starts to increase. Blood volume in the ventricle doesn't change. After the isovolumetric relaxation phase, you go back to ventricular feeling. All valves open. Cardiac output, disregard. Cardiac output is the amount of blood that is pumped by the heart in one minute. It's equivalent to the total amount of blood in the circuit, turns out. If heart rate increases, cardiac output increases, stroke volume increases, cardiac output increases. So this, you have to know the tables. If you want, I can make more copies or I can post it online, whatever you prefer. Tell me at the end of the class, all right? Stroke volume is the amount, volume of blood that is ejected during one contraction. Increased EDV increases stroke volume, increased ESV decreases stroke volume. I'm not going to focus too much on this because, look, we went over this today already. So, cardiac output equivalent to the total blood volume in the circulation at rest. Cardiac reserve is the difference between cardiac output during strenuous exercise and cardiac output at rest. What can increase EDV? Increased venous return, decreased heart rate. Okay, increased DDV will increase stroke volume and increase cardiac output. What can increase ESV? Low contractility will increase end systolic volume, and elevated afterload will increase end systolic volume. Increased end systolic volume will decrease stroke volume and decrease cardiac output. Sympathetic stimulation increases heart rate and cardiac output. Parasympathetic decreases heart rate and decreases cardiac output. Elevated blood pressure increases end systolic volume. Elevated contractility decreases end systolic volume. Sympathetic branch of autonomic nervous system can increase contractility. Parasympathetic does not have effect on it. So, lower heart rate increases venous return, increases end diastolic volume, increases stroke volume and cardiac output. Okay? Preload is the amount of blood that goes into the heart and stretches it. Remember um, the Frank Starling law that we talked about? 
the elevated stretch of cardiac muscle increases the force of contraction. Does that make sense? Elev uh, absolutely. Increased stretch of cardiac muscle increases its force of contraction. So higher preload will increase the contractile force, meaning that all that blood will be pushed into the systemic circuit or pulmonary circuit anyway. Elevated venous return. Elevated length of diastole will increase preload as well as exercise. Higher preload affects EDV, making it higher. Contractility measures the force of contraction. Contractility can be increased by all these agents. We call these agents positive ionotropic. Well, the ones that decrease contractility are negative ionotropic. So these are positive ionotropic, these are negative ionotropic. Basically, I give you a list. Contractility affects ESV. Higher contractility, lower ESV. After load, blood pressure, resistance to ejection, pressure in the great vessels. Um, increased blood pressure increases after load. After load will affect higher after load will increase and systolic volume. Sympathetic stimulation increases heart rate, parasympathetic decreases heart rate. Agents that increase heart rate are called positive chronotropic, decrease it, negative chronotropic, um, calcium, norepinephrine, temperature, exercise, positive chronotropic, acetylcholine, potassium, negative chronotropic, congestive heart failure, well, risk factors, high blood pressure, <clears throat> atherosclerosis, all that kind of regular stuff, congestive heart failure, is when one side fails to pump the adequate amount of blood and heart gets congested on one side. So, left side fails, where is congestion? Which circuit? Pulmonary. So you have pulmonary edema. Left side fails, where is conge congestion? I'm sorry. Which circuit? If left, if uh, oh. sorry about that. If right side fails, where is congestion? Huh? Systemic circuit. The signs will be edema, elevated portal pressure in the liver. Okay, sorry about that. Does that make sense so far? So in the fetal heart, fossa valis connects atria. It is not a pathology because babies do not have to breathe through the lungs, so they don't need isolated pulmonary circuit. Now, <clears throat> what I want you to know about septal defect. Septal defect is self-explanatory term, which tells you there is a defect in the septum. It can be in the interatrial septum or interventricular septum. Does that make sense? It leads to poor oxygenation of blood. Cyanosis. Transposition of great arteries, meaning that pulmonary trunk is connected to which chamber? Huh? Left ventricle and awarded to the right ventricle. So they transposed. Does that make sense? You have two cycle, uh, two circuits, pulmonary and systemic, that are completely isolated from each other. <clears throat> this is why it's incompatible with life. Aortic coarctation and aortic stenosis, narrowing down of aorta. General symptoms, <clears throat> I'm sorry, elevated blood pressure in the upper limbs, decreased blood pressure 
in the lower limbs. Okay? <clears throat> Myocardium with age becomes thicker. <clears throat> Aorta thickens as well, accumulates a lot of atherosclerotic plaques and calcifications, becomes less elastic. The H left ventricle, size of the left ventricle actually decreases because myocardium becomes thicker. Age-related problems associated with the valves. Incompetence, regurgitation. Blood flow direction between arteries and veins. Arteries from the heart, veins to the heart. Order of tunics, from the inside to the outside, Intima media external. Main components. Now, tunica intima, endothelium. Tunica media, muscle. Tunica externa, connective tissue. Capillaries don't have a tunic. They have only endothelium and basal bladder. Three types of arteries. Elastic muscular arterioles. Elastic Absorb pressure changes. Muscular arterioles are contractile ones. So vasomotor responses are in contractile. So if I ask you vasomotor responses, it's the same as ability to contract. Does that make sense? <clears throat> the largest arteries are not vasomotor active. Three types of veins. Postcapillary venules, large veins, sinuses. Both capillary ve venules are smallest. Do veins have vasomotor response? Very little. They large veins have smooth muscles. They can contract a little bit, but not a lot. They have capacitance vessels because they store blood. Sinuses are flat veins that can be found in coronary circuit, and cerebral circulation. Veins do not have a lot of smooth muscles. Function of venous valves to prevent the backflow of the blood in the veins. Types of capillaries. Look, no three types. Continuous, fenestrated, sinusoid, or can they be found like bone marrow, sinusoid, okay? Fenestrated, kidneys, <clears throat> continuous. <clears throat> skin muscle stuff like that okay cornea lens cartilage of no capillary skin well epidermis <coughs> function exchange main ways of transport diffusion infenestrated capillaries Fenestrations in sinusoids, intercellular gaps. Uh, capillary diameter is determined by the size of the blood cells, red blood cells. Tight junctions in endothelium um, limit the exchange and you know prevent the blood from going from the blood vessel into the tissue. Capillary bed is the set of capillaries that supply a particular. tissue, okay, uh, met arterial supplies the capillary bed, thoroughfare channel drains it, vascular shunt is comprised by met arterial and thoroughfare channel, they form an anastomose between the terminal arterial and postcapillary venue, function of the precapillary sphincter is to regulate the blood flow through the capillary, when they are closed there is no blood flow, open there is what can regulate the blood flow through the capillary bed tissue nutrient and oxygen requirements systemic blood flow is equivalent to cardiac output it's the blood flow through the entire systemic circuit blood flow through the organ well blood flow through one organ volume of blood that goes through the organ in a minute cardiac output equivalent systemic blood flow blood pressure Directly proportional to cardiac output and peripheral resistance. Does that make sense? 
higher the blood volume, higher blood pressure. Blood pressure gradient drives the fluid and hot blood pressure is the highest in the order, lowest in the right atrium. Peripheral resistance is the resistance to flow. That's your equation. When you think about blood pressure, it's proportional to blood flow and peripheral resistance. Factors that influence peripheral resistance. Um, turbulence of the flow, length of the blood vessels, viscosity of blood, and most importantly, diameter of the peripheral blood vessels. Um, smaller vessel diameter increases peripheral resistance. Blood pressure is highest in the order, lowest in the right atrium, stiffest drop are in the arterioles. Systolic pressure is the pressure to systole, diastolic up to diastole. Pulse pressure is difference between them. How do we calculate mean arterial pressure? Know it. It's diastolic pressure plus one third of a pulse pressure. If blood pressure increases, capillaries start to leak. Venous return is promoted by muscle, muscle and respiratory pumps, not the mechanism. Venous valves prevent the backflow. Venular constriction, does it exist? Ever, even, yes. Does it play a major role in venous return? No. Increased blood pressure in exercise. Um, sympathetic stimulation, basic constriction, increased venous return, increased cardiac output. So sympathetic activation increases the blood pressure by increasing cardiac output. Decrease in blood pressure sensed by mechanoreceptors in the aortic and carotid sinuses sends the signal to medulla oblongata. Medulla oblongata in response to decreased blood pressure stimulates cardio acceleratory center and vasomotor center. Cardio acceleratory center increases the heart rate and contractility, activated vasomotor center, constricts the blood vessels. Okay, so increased sympathetic activity, higher heart rate. Parasympathetic stimulation goes down. Um, vasomotor centers is entirely under the sympathetic control. Hypothalamus um, can increase blood pressure during the stress by stimulating medulla oblongata. Elevated CO2, decreased oxygen, decreased pH, all increase cardiac and vasomotor activity, increasing the blood pressure. Epinephrine, norepinephrine stimulate cardiac, cardiac acceleratory center, vasomotor center, increases blood pressure. Angiotensin 2 and ADH, both are in, um, sorry, vasoconstrictors. ADH increases the water retention, increases blood volume, increases blood pressure. Overall, these two increase blood pressure. Renal mechanisms, no two of them, direct and indirect. Direct mechanism, higher blood pressure, you pee more. Okay, lower blood pressure, you pee less and conserve fluid. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Remember that. Um, chain of events that I told you about. Renin activates angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 activates aldosterone. Aldosterone increases sodium retention, water retention, elevates blood volume and blood pressure. Okay, ACE inhibitors prevent Conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, which decreases the blood pressure. Okay, increased muscular pump, increased venous return. I'm going to be super quick. So what are you supposed to do here? Say, increased muscular pump, venous return goes up, cardiac output goes up, blood pressure goes up. Does that make sense? Renin activation. Renin up. Angiotensin up, aldosterone up, water retention up, blood volume up, blood pressure up. 
You see what I'm saying? It's your exercise here. Because I can ask you, what will be the effect of, I don't know, atrial nat... Okay, this one, by the way, you can cross it out. We didn't talk about it. Atrial natriuretic peptide. I will make sure that I do not ask this on the exam because we didn't talk about it in details. Okay? And we will chat about it in the renal system. So, like, what is the effect of antidiuretic hormone? Increased water retention, increased blood volume, increased blood pressure. Am I clear? False measurement. Repress artery against bone. Okay. Why do we measure it in the brachial region? Because it's closer, closest to the heart. Cord cough sounds when it appears systolic, disappear diastolic, clinical hypertension. Uh, more than 140 over 100, um, pre-hypertension between, look, to make it easier, don't memorize the numbers. Know the risk factors for hypertension. Know the difference between primary and secondary. So primary hypertension is cardiovascular disease. Secondary hypertension is caused by some other condition. No numbers. Forget about numbers. Screw numbers. Um, three types of shock. Hypovolemic, not enough blood, vascular, vasodilation, cardiogenic, heart failure. Okay, here. Acute bleeding. Tissue perfusion drops. Oxygen delivery drops. Carbon dioxide in tissues accumulates. Cellular metabolism slows down, cellular pH goes down. Does that make sense? Answer those questions. Okay? Obviously, that's effects. So, yes? Uh, what's the formula? Cellular metabolism, since not a lot of oxygen, cellular metabolism goes down. So, tissue, everything, like, everything goes down. Okay? Uh, Cardioacceleratory and vasomotor centers get activated, sympathetic system gets activated, heart rate increases, vessel diameter decreases, kidneys start to produce renin. So observable outcomes in the blood loss. Elevated heart rate, tachycardia, elevated respiratory rate, decreased urine production. ADH is increased, renin is increased, aldosterone is increased. Does that make sense? Angiotensin is increased. Observable outcomes, lower urine production. That increases blood volume, helps to restore blood pressure. Blood flow to the organ tissue is regulated by the metabolic demands. Um, Capillaries have the slowest flow rate, which enables them to exchange. Um, arterioles change the blood flow by cons uh, constricting or dilating. Systemic blood pressure is more important than local blood flow. In the case of normal blood pressure, local blood flow regulation dominates. In the case of blood pressure changes, nobody cares about the blood flow. Okay. Elevated CO2, low oxygen, low pH, increase the vessel diameter, increase tissue perfusion. Increased potassium, increased prostaglandins, increased NO, they increase tissue perfusion. Increased endothelin, decreases tissue perfusion. Myogenic controls, remember, you know, I ask you, what happens in myogenic control? Elevated blood pressure. Increases the stretch of the blood vessel, which responds with constriction. And vice versa. Angiogenesis, more oxygen demand, more new blood vessels are formed. So in the muscle, now, this thing's okay. Muscle is metabolically active. What happens to the CO2 levels? 
go up. pH goes down. Oxygen goes down. All these three signals increase the blood flow to the muscle. For the brain, remember the question that you had on the quiz? Something in the, like blood pressure increases in the brain. What happens to the diameter of the blood vessels? They constrict. Blood pressure decreases, they dilate. It works only in a certain range of the blood pressure. Steep drop in the blood pressure. In response to steep drop, blood vessels stop dilating and actually start collapsing. No blood flow to the brain. Syncope. Blood pressure in cerebral circulation is extremely high. Blood vessels in the brain give in to the high blood pressure, leading to increased blood flow and edema. Uh, hypothalamus controls the blood flow to the skin to regulate temperature. Blood flow to the lungs. Remember we talked about its opposite. Blood flow in the pulmonary circuit will be higher in the areas with higher oxygen concentration. We're clear? And vice versa. During systolic coronary ve vessels are squeezed. They take muscle from, they take oxygen from myoglobin. Um, so during diastole, blood goes from the aorta, and during exercise, it's mostly metabolic controls that regulate coronary blood vessels, blood flow. This one, I think we've done an exquisitely great job in discussing the fluid exchange in the capillary beds. <coughs> So what you need to be able to answer to? Questions like this. What happens at the arterial end? Fluid goes into the tissue, fluid goes into the capillary, something like that, okay? Second, you need to explain what are those pressures, okay? So say capillary hydrostatic pressure is exerted by blood pressure and pushes the fluid from capillary into the tissue. That's a complete description. Does that make sense? So you may end up having a question, what is one of the pressures? You have to pick a proper definition. Do I make sense? Okay. Now, which system is responsible for nullifying interstitial fluid hydrostatic pressure? Lymphatic system. Okay. So, osmotic pressure of proteins. Now, this one. Understand where it comes from. Net filtration pressure on the arterial side. Net filtration pressure on the venular side. This are by far the most important questions which you need to focus on, not on the whole exam, but particularly here. Here's the thing. That little simulation game that we played, what if blood pressure increases? So I can ask you a question. If blood pressure increases, what is going to happen? You have to think, okay, capillary hydrostatic pressure is going to go up, right? That makes sense. If it's going to go up, then fluid, more fluid, will be pushed out of the capillary. And fluid will start to accumulate in the tissue. Then I say, okay, we add a lot of protein in the blood. Like we take a whole, whole syringe of albumin and stick it into patient's uh, blood. So albumin concentration in the blood goes up. Means capillary osmotic pressure goes up and starts to pull more fluid into the capillary. Does that make sense? So um, there's going to be not enough fluid getting into the tissue. Tissue will start to get dehydrated. Does that make sense? Play. Please play with this. <coughs> 